Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for the iSchool Dean's Speaker Series. This series features established and emerging intellectual leaders presenting cutting edge research and thoughtful commentary on critical information issues that affect our lives and society. Today, we have the honor, the privilege, and the pleasure of hosting Sophia Noble. I'm gonna share a little bit about Sophia and then uh, she's gonna take it away from there. Sophia Noble is an internet studies scholar and professor of gender studies and African-American studies at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she serves as the co-founder and co-director of the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. She holds affiliations in the School of Education and Information Studies and is a research associate at the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford, where she is a commissioner on the Oxford Commission on AI and Good Governance. In 2021, Sophia was recognized as a MacArthur Foundation Fellow, also known as the Genius Award, for her groundbreaking work on algorithmic discrimination, which prompted her founding of the nonprofit Equity Engine, which accelerates investment in companies, education, and networks driven by women of color. She's the author of a best-selling book on racist and sexist algorithmic bias in commercial search engines. It's entitled Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. This book has been widely reviewed in scholarly and, public, and popular publications. She's the recipient of a Hellman Fellowship and the UCLA Early Career Award. In 2022, Sophia was recognized as the inaugural NAACP Archwell Digital Civil Rights Award recipient. So without further ado, we are going to ask Dr. Noble to go ahead and begin presenting. Please note that you can drop comments or questions in chat, and also there will be a Q&A following the presentation. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Thanks so much, Renee. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. I wish I could see you. This is almost a little bit like um, Zoom school during COVID when all the students have their um, cameras off and you're just talking to yourself. So I know that um, um, you'll bear with me with this experience and, and that um, I know that you're there and I'm, I'm really pleased to talk to you today. And please feel free to use the chat um, as we go along or drop your questions into the Q&A because I have set a timer for myself so that we have a few minutes at the end of this presentation to, um, to really ask any kinds of questions that you're interested in. Um, <clears throat> you know, I have this little um, image here running um, that is kind of reminiscent of um, some photographs that I took about three years ago in, um, in Accra in Ghana where I was looking at um, kind of, you know, some new and developing research that I can talk about um, that really kind of complicates this way of how we think about the internet. Um, so many people thinking about the internet and digital technologies as ephemeral, um, really from kind of a, a Western or US European um, vantage point, but not necessarily attending to um, the broader material dimensions of infrastructure and other kinds of um, labor conditions and labor relations, environmental um, consequences of the digital. So I would say broadly that the reason I think I call myself an internet studies scholar, although I was certainly trained in library and information science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, um, where I did both the MLIS and the PhD in LIS. Um, uh, I think that, you know, I'm probably among um, a generation of information studies scholars who have come through over the past decade um, or more, really thinking um, closely about the internet and digital technologies as knowledge and information spheres and spaces, but also um, with a lot of the attendant kinds of complicating factors that knowledge environments and information um, services have. So I'm gonna try to talk um, about the um, where that work 
has gone over the past 10 years and where what others are doing too. And hopefully this will be um, a talk that leaves you with some new resources and some new people to be thinking about and some um, um, potentially some paradigm shifting um, vantage points into some of the problems we see. So first I wanna kind of locate myself in the literature and among other scholars. And um, I put this slide together because I think that there are so many, you know, when you look at the research about um, the citations of scholars of color, particularly black scholars, um, so many of us are kind of undersighted and um, less known and certainly not taught by many faculty as part of the canon of information, um, media studies, uh, communications, and so forth. So um, I wanted to kind of just situate myself because I think it's important um, that we understand our own intellectual traditions and communities. Um, when I was a graduate student, I remember reading Craig Watkins, The Young and the Digital. And what was so impactful about his work was this idea that um, young Black teenagers, young people, um, young um, teenagers of color um, were in fact not the most digitally divided people as was kind of narrated in mainstream public policy. And of course, um, those of you who were around in the 90s as a, uh, who had come of age by the 90s remember that in the kind of early days of the internet, the way that um, people of color in particular African-Americans were talked about was always as kind of digitally divided or on the wrong side of technology, the wrong side of history. And Craig's book was really important in that it really was a counter narrative against that um, public policy framing, um, which, which helped us understand that in fact, young, um, people of color are actually the most connected. And of course, I remember this so much in my own coming of age um, where, uh, you know, this was the before smartphones in the, in the era of pagers and beepers and, you know, kind of the only people in my town where I grew up um, who had pagers and beepers um, and even early cell phones were like surgeons and medical doctors and people kind of on call at the hospital and the brothers in my high school. So, you know, there's this kind of um, way in which we need to look into communities that are often um, overlooked or not the center of our scholarly inquiries to learn a whole, um, a whole lot about what's happening in the culture. And of course, one of the things we know um, um, through that work is the degree to which like youth, you know, Black youth culture so dramatically affects the broader popular culture in terms of uptake and use. And, you know, there are others here. Um, uh, I won't go through each one of these um, folks, but I will say that, um, you know, these early thinkers like um, Anna Everett talking about the digital diaspora and this, you know, this book being such an amazing complement to um, Charlton Macklin's Black Software to really help us understand kind of the early days of, um, of African-Americans in Silicon Valley and in the tech sector. Um, certainly, um, um, now in the kind of co contemporary moment, we see people like Kashana Gray um, writing about um, kind of critical race theory and video games um, in her woke gaming. And of course, um, Ruha Benjamin, um, not only with Race After Technology, but her new book that just came out this week, Viral Justice. Um, so many people here whose work are very important interventions at the intersection of race, technology, and society. And so I put them on your um, radar because I want you to know um, uh, that my work kind of shows up taking up another you know, discrete artifact of search engines to really understand um, when you center Black people, when you center women um, of color, what happens um, in our understanding of a variety of different kinds of digital technologies and ecosystems. And so that's really um, what many, you know, all of these different books are helping us to do. Um, you know, 
I will just say that kind of the highlights of uh, this work, and I won't, I'm going to try not to talk too much about um, algorithms of oppression specifically, but really kind of situate it in a trajectory and then talk about mostly about kind of the, the now and the future um, in this talk. Um, you know, the, the work has really focused for um, many years now, uh, kind of going back to the kind of first earliest publications that I did as a graduate student and coming out of graduate school in 2012 and 13, um, all about trying to dislodge this idea that um, digital technologies and internet um, companies themselves uh, are kind of neutral actors in the space of culture, politics, and power. And um, that I think is probably uh, one of the more interesting dimensions of research. And I, and I say this for the students who are watching, especially the graduate students, that certainly in 2010, 11, and 12, when I was writing my uh, PhD and kind of getting, getting that degree, I certainly um, felt like it was kind of pushing a boulder up a mountain to make legible this idea that the platforms like Google, like Facebook, other kinds of social media, um, even library systems were not neutral spaces. And I think we had done so much more work around the library, quite frankly, you know, we had this amazing history of Hope Olson and um, uh, Sanford Berman, um, you know, whose work certainly heavily influenced mine to, to help us understand the library as a site of political power in communities. Um, but we had less kind of attention uh, in the early aughts and into the first decade of, of um, this century to think about technology companies as um, more than tool makers. And um, many of the papers that I was, have been writing over those years was trying to give examples of how um, algorithmic design was actually implicated in some of the worst kinds of, um, you know, hateful or harmful, um, misogynistic or misrepresentative types of, um, of material circulating, if you will. Now, we have fast forward to 2022 and we have whole um, centers around the country that focus on mis and disinformation. But you know, these ideas of trying to um, talk about the way in which technology companies were harming the public was actually has actually been, I think, a project for the last 30 years. And of course, my work is building on people like Wendy Chun at Simon Fraser University, Lisa Nakamura at the University of Michigan, um, you know, Jerry Kong at UCLA Law School, you know, um, writing this early paper about cyber racism. Really kind of, I um, see this work trying to tease out and make more mainstream our understanding of the harmful effects of digital technologies. Um, of course that, led ultimately to this monograph um, NY, with NYU Press, um, Algorithms of Oppression. Um, of course, there had been many books written by 2018, um, even by 2016, at the time the book went into press, uh, talking about um, Google, um, Siva Vaidyanathan's The Googleization of Everything and Why We Should Worry, probably being the most influential book for me and my career. Um, of, you know, in the kind of development of algorithms of oppression, because he helps us understand broadly the implications of a private, um, a privately held, even though publicly traded kind of um, advertising company controlling our knowledge infrastructure. And um, of course, that book came out at the kind of height of um, the frenzy about Google as kind of the new public library. I mean, people were actually using that. Even Susan Wojcicki um, at YouTube, the CEO of YouTube, has written um, and commented uh, that Google, that YouTube is like just like the library. And um, my colleague Sarah Roberts at um, the UCLA has written a great piece kind of taking down this type of logic that YouTube is, is a library. In fact, it's anything but. But 
um, at the time that um, this book came out, we really were starting to see much more evidence of um, the way in which companies were designing their software in um, harmful ways. And um, what I did kind of going back to that earlier slide with my colleagues, um, what I tried to do was center Black women and girls as really the, the primary case study. Of course, there's much more um, in this book than just um, collecting searches. I mean, there's really like the implications of this for the library as well and for other kinds of information um, services professionals to be thinking about. But really, it was kind of one of the first of its kind works to center Black feminism and critical race theory as um, frameworks to help us understand how race is encoded into large-scale digital, digital platforms. Um, I have to say that this now seems to be like a common sense understanding. Um, of course, you know, we see young people all the time, content creators of, of many different types um, using and engaging with platforms now, um, especially in the social media space, talking about being shadow banned or having their content suppressed or really understanding that there's that this isn't just a free speech zone that they're in where anything they post goes. Um, of course, we know now from uh it, it, wonderful films like The Cleaners and other kinds of um, journalistic and academic accounts of content moderation that, um, uh, uh, and of course I would recommend Sarah Roberts um, behind the screen in the shadows of social media as kind of the first academic study of, of content moderators. Um, we know now that in fact, these spaces are anything but free speech zones. And they also are not just spaces where what is most popular comes to the fore. And these are the kinds of things that I think are now an extremely rich area of study. Um, there truly is um, uh, so much more work to be done. And so my encouragement to graduate students, especially if you are um, thinking about and wondering what kind of um, projects you should be taking on or studies you, you should be conducting, there's still so much more to do. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, kind of this, this primary case study in um, the book was really about um, what happens when you do keyword searches on girls and women of color in particular. And um, I won't read this, it's a little bit small, but um, what I found was that over the course of um, kind of from 2009 until the fall of uh, 2012, whenever you did keyword searches on black girls, Asian girls, Latina girls in particular, um, the first page of search results was almost completely pornography or kind of hypersexualized um, media. Now this is important because at the time when we talked about search um, results, um, the prevailing logic was that this would just be a matter of what was most popular and what other people were searching for. And of course, never problematizing um, what it means that um, when girls of color are looking for themselves, that they would be bombarded also with this kind of material, likely not what they're looking for and likely not what they think represents them. Um, so these kinds of things are really important. Of course, I um, spent a lot of time unpacking that and then also talking about kind of these pre-internet stereotypes about the sexualization and hyper um, um, kind of sexual commodification of women and girls of color, in particular Black women and girls, and how those racist and sexist tropes in our society, not just in the U.S., but around the world, kind of are used in service of maintaining control over black women's bodies and girls' bodies. And you see this, for example, kind of the emergence of this trope of the hypersexualized black woman and girl comes into um, fashion in the US around the time that the transatlantic slave trade is abolished and made illegal. And the only way in which you can reproduce the enslaved African <clears throat> slave force is to um, um, is through kind of rape and, and um, forced reproduction. So what you have then is um, um, 
a narrative that emerges that black women want to have sex all the time or black women and girls um, are more sexual. And this of course becomes a rationale for um, forced reproduction. And so this is a very important kind of history. And I think these early pre-internet histories and contexts and power relations are so important for understanding the contemporary moment um, and how um, the internet, like what role the internet is playing in um, producing and reproducing harmful power relationships. Um, I'm always inspired by people like Jessica Gandhi and uh, Jessica Davis and Oscar Gandhi. Um, one of the things that they, you know, they had this really important paper that so influenced my writing um, where they, you know, they focus so much on media representations, but what they help us understand is how these media representations, and I might even add misrepresentations and sites of propaganda, are used to kind of influence the distribution of resources. And so in the book, I reference people like Melissa Harris Perry, um, who are writing about public policy being um, written in ways that are unfavorable and harmful to Black communities, but especially Black women and children. And of course, part of that is the tropes, the racist tropes that circulate in our society, whether it's the hypersexualized Black women or um, it kind of newly re-narrated as the welfare queen, um, kind of in the post-1970s moment. Um, these become really important um, tropes to study and to understand so that when they appear in something so normalized like a search engine, we actually can understand them and apprehend them as propaganda that has been able to uh, kind of uh, uh, be optimized to the top of the search pile. And I think this is so important, you know, unlike um, other um, types of technologies, let's say even a technology like the library and its organization. One of the things that we have in um, the library is we have like these subjective understandings that there is curation happening, that librarians are making selections, that probably every book in the world is not in the library, that there are some type of public, you have to be published. Um, and there's publishing criteria. We kind of understand all those subjectivities. We actually, if we walk the stacks, we can see the relationship between ideas in our society about people and kind of where they're classified and where they're organized in the physical kind of brick and mortar spaces. <clears throat> What's harder on the internet and kind of in a platform like Google or, or Bing or Yahoo, kind of any of the major um, US search engines is that <clears throat> we think of those spaces as extremely neutral. We think of them as being highly credible. We have narratives coming out of Silicon corridors around the world that technologists um, know how to deploy things like artificial intelligence to um, sort the best to the top. Um, so we think that there has been a superior logic deployed in these kinds of spaces. And of course, they also obfuscate the fact that they are um, advertising platforms, for example. So we don't think of Google search as a giant advertising marketplace, but of course that fundamentally is what it is. We think of it instead as a, um, um, uh, a place that organizes all the world's information or all the world's knowledge, right? And kind of going from their own playbook. So this to me is one of the reasons why search is so incredibly important to study. And of course, not only because it displaces the import of libraries and other kinds of universities and other types of knowledge organizations, but also it um, has such a, um, it's shrouded in misunderstanding. And these are the reasons why, um, why we work here. Um, this book has now kind of joined, um, you know, a, a pantheon of other books that are kind of feminist um, and, and uh, thinking about um, the kind of the political economy and the, um, the 
racialized dimensions of knowledge of, and information. And so I just kind of put this, these are all photos that I have in here that I find on the internet of like algorithms of oppression in the wild. So um, uh, just kind of sharing out. So, you know, since um, oh, over the past decade, I would say there have been a number of new centers and um, projects that have come into existence. These are just a handful that I want to share because they are either led by or founded by um, um, Black scholars. Um, uh, obviously, the Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, which I co-founded with uh, Professor Roberts, um, the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab, um, uh, Bruha Benjamin's lab at Princeton, um, the Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies at NYU is a really fantastic resource. I really want to encourage you to go to um, find them uh, at NYU, find us. Um, this is a group, um, I think there's a way to join a listserv or a mailing list um, on the website. I, I know it's been kind of newly redesigned, but that's a place where people who are interested in these issues or where they're kind of foregrounding race in a variety of different, different digital inquiries where we gather. And um, uh, we started as about 10 people in New York about five or six years ago. And now I think there are hundreds of people on our listserv. And um, uh, again, we try to share syllabi and resources and articles and things so that as you, it, particularly for students, as you're trying to figure out like, where do I jump in to this conversation? How do I know how to find what to read? Um, this is a wonderful resource for you. Um, our uh, friend and colleague, Joy Bolamini, um, Dr. Bolamini now um, from the MIT Media Lab, of course, starting the Algorithmic Justice League and, um, and uh, the important work of our colleagues there that's much more focused on, I think, um, shifting industry norms and um, studying commercial software um, products that are kind of off the shelf. And her, of course, her um, very famous study with Dr. Tamit Jabru and Deb Raji about um, called Gender Shades about facial recognition software, not recognizing Black women's faces and that that um, being so important. Um, my project, you know, Equity Engine is really about mutual aid and support for big ideas that often don't get taken up um, uh, in the world by um, uh, big ideas by women of color. Um, uh, Sharon Tedica at UC Santa Barbara running the Seeds Lab and um, that research center really focused on people who are doing big data kinds of work, uh, but are interested in minoritized communities and big data. That's definitely a place um, out of the Center for Black Studies at UC Santa Barbara. And then of course, um, our friends, um, Terrence Keel at UCLA, Dr. Keel and his autopsy lab, which is another really amazing, I think, innovation in doing big data analysis and kind of close reading of autopsy reports of people who are held in police custody and um, who die while they are in um, police custody and um, under the hand of law enforcement. And um, that kind of forensic work that's happening in that lab uh, is so interesting, I think, and important too. Um, to understanding how we can use data to help victims of injustice in our society. And it's a really powerful model. So I encourage you to take a look at his autopsy lab. And then of course, our friend, um, Dr. Tamit Jabru, who is the former head of Google's um, ethical AI team. Uh, you know her because she was in the media uh, just about a little over a year ago. She was fired for writing a very important paper um, with her colleagues from the University of Washington about um, Google's kind of natural language processing uh, uh, systems being incredibly racially discriminatory and terrible for the environment. And um, upon her firing, she started DARE, the Distributed AI Research Institute. And I encourage anyone, I share all of these different resources with you because I think um, as we are looking for models for um, uh, the use of data to positively transform society and kind of in um, and with a social justice lens, you know, all of these are projects that attempt to do that and um, are also woefully under supported, but they are models for you, of course, at Maryland and at other um, places to um, think about um, 
how to generate new conversations around the use of data that are actually expressly in service of people who have traditionally been harmed um, through the kind of weaponization of data and uh, information systems. For us at um, C2I2, uh, this year, Sarah Roberts is, is leading the center and I am incubating a new national center on race and digital justice, but we have been able to do things like hire um, an artist in residence, support people who are making kind of analog um, projects in the world, art projects in the world that elevate our understanding of um, people who have traditionally been harmed in our society. And so Ogi Ibono is just wrapping up her artist in residence with us. Um, we have a variety of visiting scholars. Um, please uh, keep an eye out. And in the spring quarter, we announce um, a summer fellows program. And this year we had four summer um, dissertation fellowships that we gave out. Uh, to support researchers and we kind of work with them. So if you're interested in kind of these critical um, political economies and other types of um, feminist inquiries around um, technology and the digital, we're a great center for you and you should um, definitely kind of stay in touch with us. So let me kind of talk about for just a few more minutes um, where this work, like what has this decade been about and kind of where is it going? I think um, you know, the, the work right now that there is to do is, um, of course, many students, um, pre former students of mine who are professors now are doing very important work looking at everything from, you know, I think of like um, Matt Bowie at um, Michigan looking at the use of um, Yelp and Zillow data and how that feeds into gentrification of communities of color or um, uh, Dr. Brooklyn Gibson, who's at Illinois now at Urbana-Champaign, looking at um, uh, racialized propaganda that targets Black communities in service of kind of voter suppression, disinformation, misogyny, misogynoir um, against Black women. Um, so many really important Courtney Cox looking at um, sports analytics and the, the types of analytics that are kept on players in service of kind of control further kind of biometrically surveilling um, high performance and elite athletes. Um, so many interesting, I, I just like, so many interesting places where we need to be looking at the use of tech in society and on communities and especially in communities of color. And so um, all of that for me has been um, generative and thinking about what does it mean from a policy perspective to take on big tech. And of course, that also includes little tech or like tech that is not um, a household name in the way that we think of like the major companies. And um, for me, part of this kind of paradigm shifting that I can tell you that I've seen over the past decade has been kind of a handful, mostly of women scholars um, LGBTQ and um, scholars of color who have been um, at the forefront of just pressing our research um, out into the public and really trying to translate the harms that we see in studies that we've conducted um, into kind of a broader public understanding. So this kind of research dissemination is so, so, so important because what it's allowed for is a much greater voice in the public also of the kind of people who aren't researchers, who don't have PhDs, um, to, but activists and organizers to really um, have validated the things that they thought they saw happening in their communities and in the places and spaces where they work and then building. And so now we have really important work happening, led, I think, by a number of um, civil rights and community um, organizations, racial justice organizations. Probably you saw most notably um, uh, last week, Color of Change, we um, announced the Black Tech Agenda, which is really an agenda um, in, you know, kind of pointed toward Congress in um, protecting the rights of workers, of 
of Black businesses, of content creators, and of users of a variety of platforms who are disproportionately targeted in harmful ways, whether it's kind of the lack of visibility and suppression of their content or their websites, their materials, whether it's um, working in unjust conditions from Amazon warehouses to content moderators for Facebook or YouTube, um, um, or whether it's kind of active trolling and um, targeted kind of doxing and hate crimes that happen um, that disproportionately affect Black communities in the U.S., um, all of that is really kind of part of what I think of as my work to in kind of taking on big tech, and. I'm writing now about um, kind of what did it mean in other historical moments where we took on um, big industries that felt totalizing and um, insurmountable. Um, how did that happen? How did we shift, um, for example, our uh, total reliance uh, on enslaved labor markets uh, to produce the era of big cotton? and kind of big agriculture in the US. Of course, we know one of the prevailing um, logics at that time was that um, we couldn't dispense with the transatlantic slave trade or the um, institution of enslavement and chattel slavery in the United States because the American economy was dependent upon it. In fact, the economies of the Americas were dependent upon it. And of course, what we know is that it was a handful relative to the kind of millions of people who benefited under that system or, and the, you know, um, millions of people who were harmed through the transatlantic slave trade or murdered or died under the brutal weight of that. Um, it was really a handful of people who were abolitionists who effectively organized again and again and again for centuries to dislodge the systems. Um, we know um, with this kind of era. Um, now, this is where all my Gen Xers here on the call, you know what I'm talking about, because all of us probably went to the store and bought cigarettes for our parents or something. Um, I try to explain to my students at UCLA that, you know, when I was born, um, you can't find my mint, when I was born, the doctor probably had a cigarette like hanging from his mouth while I was delivered. I'm sure my mom's chain smoked two, two packs of cigarettes right after giving birth. Um, this seems hard to believe because so many younger people, uh, younger than Gen X, who um, can't imagine that kind of um, normalcy of big tobacco in our lives, of course. Um, we know that it was not only kind of a um, class action lawsuit against big tobacco, but you know, documented proof of harms um, of the tobacco industry that really um, put the brakes on the way in which tobacco could operate in the United States. Now, of course, one of the also kind of the failures of taking on big tobacco was that there was not a coordinated international kind of set of regulatory practices. So big tobacco just moved all of its um, tobacco business offshore from the United States. So that's something for us to be mindful of as we think about um, the tech sector and the kinds of regulations and protections we would want for the public and how there might be greater international coordination. And I would say that is probably one of the most important um, movements that's underway right now. Um, so I talk more about this specifically in a very short um, talk with Ethan Zuckerman um, and that you're welcome to watch sometime if you're interested. Um, there also has been, you know, for me, my work kind of taken up in the Real Facebook Oversight Board, um, also of which I'm a member of. Um, you might be familiar with the um, that Facebook established an oversight board, which they call the Facebook Oversight Board, that was there to kind of help um, uh, mediate and adjudicate content that moves through Facebook and um, its threats to communities, to people, to individuals, to democracy. Um, uh, the Facebook Oversight Board uh, managed to never convene. And so um, 
uh, prior to it finally having its first meeting, a number of, of social media critics, journalists, um, and scholars studying Facebook can uh, kind of assembled to make the real Facebook Oversight Board. And of course, it has been um, very active. We continue to be very active around um, uh, responding to the kind of like whitewashing um, uh, of um, Facebook's, you know, human rights audits, for example. So you can find a lot of information here as well from a number of experts who are tracking what's happening with Facebook. Um, of course, this is really important to me. At the end of the book, when I was writing Algorithms of Oppression, um, it was 2016, right as that book was going to bed. And <clears throat> kind of the epilogue of that book is that um, the news story that had broken where um, when you did a, a search on final election results, <clears throat> excuse me, final election results for the 2016 presidential election, um, the top hit in Google took you to a disinformation site that reported out that Donald Trump had won the popular vote, which of course we know is not a fact that he won the electoral college. But this is so important when you think about democratic elections. And in fact, I'm sorry to report out that we have enough credible evidence now, I think, to know that the next presidential election will be rife with um, propaganda, <clears throat> <clears throat> likely, uh, you know, another coup attempt, um, some very, very dark um, and heavy days ahead of us. And this is one of the reasons why it's so incredibly important to understand. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we saw, for example, in Facebook's own research and its own study recently, about six months ago, was Facebook trying to understand its al uh, algorithms and its kind of socializ socializing force. And so it made the empty profile, Carol, I'm sure some of you um, watched this and, and picked this up. And Carol had had never liked anything. She had no affiliations. She was an empty profile. And within a week, Carol was full-blown QAnon, right-wing radicalized. So even Facebook does not know how and why this happens. And of course, um, our colleagues studying things like um, housing discrimination and other kinds of employment discrimination algorithms and the role of Facebook in that um, have been very, very important for helping to enact public policy or fines um, uh, or rules by the Federal Trade Commission. Um, I, as I mentioned, this kind of um, human rights report in India, I think is important. I just put it in here because I want you to know about this. This is just a, a very clear um, uh, role that I think researchers also with our expertise have to play, which is studying the kinds of discourses um, that come out of tech companies and the way in which they position and or quite frankly deny um, the truth of kind of the data and reporting that we have. Um, so this is very, again, important. And I, I found this to be an important aspect of my own work, which is to um, uh, provide expertise and unpacking and understanding things that are happening in the tech industry. All right. So as I close here, what are some things that we can do? Um, well, certainly I think we have to integrate like these kind of science, technology, and AI conversations with more kind of critical ethnic studies um, perspectives. Now, that was something that was very difficult for me to do when I was a graduate student. I was taking lots of classes in uh, kind of outside of the high school, quite frankly. Um, I had had a background in um, Black studies as an undergraduate, and I was a, a kind of sociologist, and so I was prepared and I knew how to go and look for those things, but these things really should be at the heart to me of any iSchool, and, and, and um, um, creating people who are literate about society is so, so important, and of course, we live in a multiracial society, and um, there are, you know, um, the global majority are people of color. So it's just untenable anymore to me to think that we do not center ethnic studies as a, um, a, a grounding set of epistemologies to help us understand the information, knowledge, data, and technology. I think we need more of these centers of expertise that are focused on race and tax. So I have that page. It only had a few. Of course, there are a handful more 
but we need more and more of these centers and we need more coordination um, among them. Um, I think activating many broad co coalitions to protect the public from dangerous technologies, you know, scholars really have a role to play, especially information um, scholars. I think about our work as being um, uh, modeled on what climate scientists have done. And one of the things we know from climate scientists is that they now report out that they wished that they had been much more vocal and activist with what they knew in the research that they were conducting, rather than taking a passive stance um, and thinking that they would write the reports on climate change and they would hand it to um, politicians and they would make good policy. So we actually have to find ourselves, um, I think, to be um, uh, deploying our expertise so powerfully at a time when it feels like the stakes are very high. Um, this is a very important moment for us to be doing that. And then I think connecting these dots between technology and the collapse of modern, you know, kind of liberal democracies, economies, civil and human rights violations, we see these things on the escalation. Um, we see democracy and the investment in it on the decline. Um, I'm reading this book right now. Oh, did I bring it? Oh, here, my computer's on it. I'm going to hold it up for you so to see. I was just at a conference and I was speaking um, on a panel just before Kathleen Bellew, um, who's a professor at Northwestern. She's uh, written this book called Bring the War Home. And it's about the white power movement and paramilitary America. My son said, wow, dad, but he, she, he goes, wow, mom, that's a super depressing book. Indeed it is. But um, what's so fascinating about this is kind of connecting these dots between the things we know, you know, here I think about um, Kathleen's book up against Jesse Daniels' amazing book, Cyber Racism, um, from several years ago, I think from 2016, that um, was a clear articulation of the way in which like white power organizations use the internet to organize, to destabilize societies and communities. Um, so connecting these dots is so, so important. And of course, we're experts in technology um, and um, its future. And of course, the role of knowledge and information as an antidote um, to some of these crises. And so I think I'll leave it there and say thank you so much um, for this kind of invitation. Um, the thing to remember is that, you know, we have more data and technology than ever, but we have more inequality and injustice to go with it. What is that relationship there um, and how can we um, kind of mitigate uh, uh, what's ahead? Thank you so much. And thank I will you. take a look here. Yeah, thank you so much, Sophia. Um, we do, I'm sure that questions are going to be being popped into the Q&A um, box. And I would appreciate if you all put in the Q&A. Chat will work, but um, I'm kind of focusing on the Q&A area. There was a question though, that while you were talking that I wanted to, um, to bring up. And let me find that. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of context and then there's the question. When you were talking about research dissemination, Okay, the person starts with um, that they absolutely agree that it's so important, but sometimes I worry about the channels of dissemination like social media or large news outlets being privately controlled and opposed to accountability of certain type, anything that can hurt their profit model or something they cannot appropriate. And then the question is, can you speak to this worry about reducing publicly controlled spaces of research dissemination and discussion? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think it's Pranav, if I if I if I hope I said that right. Um, you know, this is one of the challenges, and this is where I so appreciate um, you know the work of um, Catherine Knight Steele. Obviously, her incredible work around um, digital black feminism. Um, you know, Sarah Jackson um, uh, writing about hashtag activism. You know, you have people who are helping us understand, um, of course, Andre Brock writing about Black Twitter, um, the ways in which these technologies have been apprehended by social movements and by communities to counter narrate or to speak back or to push back 
on, um, you know, a variety of, of injustices in our society. Um, of course, Black Lives Matter being so powerfully organized as well on the internet. Um, I think at the same time, we would be naive to not understand the incredible surveilling force and power of social media um, and the internet and networked technologies in general. Um, we know that if you organize on Facebook, you are directly organizing kind of like, uh, you know, in front of law enforcement, that's just so dangerous. Um, I think Signal is probably one of the last technologies that we have that really is kind of truly privacy protecting, and I encourage people to use Signal. Um, so, you know, these are the complicating factors about um how to create communities that are um, high functioning, highly democratic, bring about high quality of life, um, expanded rights and opportunity for people. And not all of that will be organized through digital technologies. So I think that's part of the thing that we wanna remember is that um, you're absolutely right. Um, without, Kind of public infrastructure, um, technical uh, or analog. And of course, for me, this is where um, I've always kind of talked about and foregrounded libraries because, you know, imagine if we, uh, someone on Twitter said once, imagine if we tried to propose the concept of a library now, like if we'd never had libraries before in our lives and we tried to propose the concept of a library, like it would be met with so much hostility like there would just be no space in the imaginary for something like the shared resources of, of, of knowledge sharing um publicly funded taxpayer supported so i think these models are also extremely important this is for my my l friends my library friends in the iSchool you know, this is why holding the space for libraries and continuing to fight for them is so incredibly important because we have to have other kinds of imaginaries about um, um, sharing resources. And of course, what we know from um, research in the environment is that we have to find more sustainable and shared ways and cooperative ways to live. So I think, um, uh, you know, Reducing publicly controlled spaces is probably one of, should be um, in our priority list um, uh, of things to, to work against. You know, we need, we're, we've lost public parks and public spaces in our cities and in our towns and communities. Um, we need to hold on to and build and expand upon those spaces. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I heard, um, you know, Kathleen talk about in, in, when she was on this panel talking about this um, book is um, the degree to which um, racism is such a, a powerful organizing logic that communities would rather shut down their public spaces than share them in integrated ways. Um, and so we know this like from the 1960s um, uh, after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, when um, public pools, swimming pools had to be integrated and white communities would rather drain their pools and not let their own children swim than, can, than let their, their children swim with black children. Um, so these kinds of I ideas are also tied up into the ways that we think about public resources and public goods, who's deserving of them and who is not. And those are, this is why we have to really do the work of um, kind of anti-racist education um, in order to contend with like the public and who who's in and who's out of it. Great question. Yeah, there's a question that's been popped into the Q&A. Um, you can see it here. Pools and schools, Amelia for the win. Amelia, actually, everybody just go talk to Amelia because really, truly, she knows. Um, okay, there's a question in the Q&A. Um, Patricia says, as I saw your work, I keep thinking about how many issues you mentioned happening in LA that are also happening here in Baltimore, but are not as well documented. If we're looking to work with someone like you to do this kind of research in Baltimore, um, 
I think the question is, who do we reach out to? Um, how do we find researchers that are, um, or how or do we look for local researchers? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that um, there's a lot of um, importance for having people who have kind of a deep local embedded contextualized understanding. Um, maybe this is the sociologist in me where I feel that, um, you know, dropping in on a community that I do not understand intimately is much harder um, and doesn't always produce the best research. Um, I know that there is like a, a, a feeling that, you know, we do objective scientific research that can be applied anywhere. And certainly our methods of, of how we go about um, our inquiries might be shared um, and broad and might be um, in common, but I think the context and the place um, where we do that work with the local knowledge is so, so important. And so um, there's no doubt that in the DMV, there are many, many amazing scholars um, and researchers who really understand um, Baltimore. Um, and uh, I think also looking outside of um, the field of of information or like kind of like even in the high school, like looking out outside to sociologists, to anthropologists, um, to people working in black studies in particular, um, who uh, might have very nuanced, even political science um, understandings of the kind of political organization, social economic organization of a community. Um, you're right, these, um, the other place to look is um, uh, activists, kind of racial justice and economic justice organizations that are also often deeply networked um, across cities. So we have um, Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, for example, is a very important community organization in LA that we've learned a lot about um, the surveillance state from and the use of um, different types of surveillance technologies by law enforcement because they practice them on people who live on Skid Row, um, people experiencing homelessness how, who are unhoused. And um, there are corollary um, organizations. I think that the um, um, media justice organizations, um, uh, free press, media justice, you know, they also are often very deeply embedded um, and have great researchers in their teams. Um, and those are a lot of times journalists, investigative journalists um, who are working and with community organizers. So that would be how I would start if I moved to Baltimore and wanted to start up research um, in these areas. Okay. Uh, we have only three minutes left. We have time for one more question. Um, that final question is, do you have thoughts on how engineers and researchers can contribute to this effort? Um, do I have thoughts about how um, engineers and researchers? Well, certainly um, engineers can push very hard. I mean, we are, there's no, one occupation that is going to solve for making the world better, safer, um, more full and amazing um, for everyone. And of course that to me, for me, that's what I get up every day and kind of work on. Um, the, I think there are a number of people who are going into work at companies, engineers, software engineers in particular, um, other kinds of um, uh, engineers who are refusing to put their labor in service um, of different kinds of projects. And of course, this is where um, uh, Google walkouts, Facebook strikes, you know, Amazon strikes, these are really important um, that tech workers themselves organize, unionize and, and stay connected around the kind of work that they will do in the world and refusing to do certain types of work. And that seems to have been um, a really amazing um, movement over the last decade that has started to shift the way we think about Silicon Valley as kind of a holistic um, monolithic set of, of workers. There's actually a lot of different kinds of workers who work in technology and so, um, 
creating greater alliances with uh, call center workers or warehouse workers, um, even globally, global labor solidarities, you know, miners, people who have to work in the extractive industries in order to make microprocessor chips and other types of um, hardware. Um, so I think that's very important and to be educated about that. Engineers really can't just be coders anymore um, and not really understand what they're code means socially, politically, economically. So I think that's like, if I were an engineer, I'd be double majoring in like internet studies or digital media studies or, you know, um, uh, information um, science or something that would give me access to science and technology studies, something, um, even black studies or gender studies truly to get a better grip on these conversations. Thank you for that. I want to say thank you to everyone who joined us today. We really, really appreciate you. Sophia, we give you an, an extra set of applause. Um, I, I imagine this work is often heartbreaking and heavy, but it's so necessary. And we are so grateful that you're doing this work and sharing it with all of us. Thank so, you. You're a wonderful thank you. community. Thank you for including me. And um, I'm here with you and for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll see all of the thanks and applause coming over in the, in the chat as well. Thank you. Appreciate you.